أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين على سيدنا وحبيبنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين ونستهدي ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد قال الله تعالى في قرآن الحكيم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون صدق الله المولانا العظيم ورفعنا بالقرآن الحكيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Greetings of peace and blessings to all of my brothers and sisters on this Zoom. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieves from us distractions from our hearts and impediments in our way so that the next few minutes that we have together are well received and well heard, not only by the ears, but also by the hearts. We begin in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, and we recognize that all blessings and all gifts and all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the Lord and the master of the universe, the creator, the sustainer, the nurturer, the nourisher of the heavens and the earth. Everything in the highest of the heavens and everything in the bottomless pits of the oceans and everything in between that which can be seen and that which cannot be seen are all completely dependent on him who is, in, who is dependent on no one. We are all dependent on him and he is independent of anything, self-subsisting, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so on this auspicious occasion of Yawm al Jum'ah, the blessed day of Friday, and on this beautiful auspicious occasion of being in the last 10 days of the month of Ramadan, we renew that deep testimony of faith within our hearts and express it upon our tongues and articulate it through our limbs in the way that we live. That there is no deity worthy of worship whatsoever other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, sovereign and guardian is he and all powerful is he over all affairs. And we bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his loving mercy sent prophets and messengers to teach us and to show us the path to Sirat al Mustaqim, the straight path. So we send our peace and our blessings upon all of those great prophets and messengers, and we send our choices, peace and blessings upon our beloved, the chosen one, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and upon his family, and upon the entirety of his companions who are pure, and the entirety of the Muslim ummah till the day that time comes to an end. My brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, this is such a special day for us to be alive, for us to be breathing, and for us to recognize ourselves as submitters, as Muslims, and as believers, as mu'mineen, and as those who strive to live with beautiful character and deeds in the world, muhsineen. It is beautiful that we are sitting in this moment aware of what these terms mean, aware of these lines that give us strength, that give us openings, that gives us an ability to transcend ourselves and to be deeply connected to the heavens. 
and the reason for this great fortune of being able to sit here today and count as our greatest blessing this religion of Islam in our lives and guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we all owe it to this very 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 momentous night and that is the night of Laylatul Qadr the night of destiny and the night of might and power and I wish to speak to you entirely today about this beautiful night Laylatul Qadr because we are in the last 10 nights of this blessed month of Ramadan and tonight is one of the odd nights the 23rd night in Ramadan and according to authenticated agreed upon hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that we should look for laylatul qadr the night of power and destiny and might in the last 10 nights in another hadith on the odd nights of the last 10 nights in another hadith on the 27th night but in reality, when you bring these hadith together, these reports together, one can only say, Allahu Ta'ala Alam, Allah knows best. This is a secret that the Divine has kept with Himself most firmly as to exactly what day Laylatul Qadr will be. But at least if we take the frame that the Prophet ﷺ gave, which is the last 10 nights, and if we don't have strength for all of those last 10 nights, then at least the other frame that he gave us, which is one of the odd nights of the last 10 nights. That these are nights that we should be searching for with the zealousness and the seriousness that one would search for the greatest blessing that they can ever imagine. And if it were told to you that the greatest blessing that you could ever want in your life is right at your fingertips, you just have to stay up in the nights and you just have to await its arrival and then you just have to embrace it with all of your soul. Then would you not spend those 10 nights in feverish awakefulness, looking outside your window and waiting for that knock on the door? And in an analogy or metaphor that Imam al-Haddad Rahmallah alayhi gave in his book, the book of assistance. He says that if someone were to tell you that they are going to bring to you a bag of gold that will make you very, very rich in one of these last 10 nights, but they're not sure exactly what night they would come on, what would your response be? He said, if your response will be that you would wake up every single of those nights waiting for that knock looking for that sign outside the window then that is the exact response that you should have and even more when it comes to searching for Laylatul Qadr so let us then get into a short and brief discourse on exactly what this blessed and most beautiful night that we are searching for in these nights is all about and we don't have to go any further than the Qur'an itself because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in surah number 97 that uh, this, what, this nice, what this night is entirely about. And so we're going to go over those ayat together and I'm going to put it on the screen for you because this is not a khutbah, it's a, it's a bayan. And so you have more flexibility with what you can do when you're doing a bayan. <clears throat> and so I'm going to put the verses on the screen for you. But before I do that, I want us to consider one thing, which is about the architectural beauty of the Quran, such that this surah, surah number 97, right? The surah that is about Laylatul Qadr and that is uh, titled Al Qadr that this surah is found right sandwiched between two other very beautiful surahs 
And as last week we talked about the Quran being an ocean by the analogy or the metaphor of the scholars, and there's a lot to be said about an ocean and why an ocean was chosen, but for its vastness and its deepness especially, and its place of giving great life, that the Quran acts that way and every surah is like a river that comes from this ocean. So, Surah Al-Qadr has this river. It is a river from the ocean of the Quran. The source is the Quran, but it has its own distinct beauty. It has its own distinct marvels, and it has its own distinct benefits and blessings. And this river is sandwiched between two other rivers. Before it is the river, which is Surah Al-Alaq. And Surah Al-Alaq is the surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the revelation of the Quran upon the heart and the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first revelations that came down from the heavens through the Archangel Gabriel to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is found in the beginning portion of this surah. And the main theme of this surah is for man to be humble and to know their origins. And the essence of the surah is about knowledge and wisdom, which is what the beginning of every great discourse must be on. And then the surah on the other side of the river is its own river by the name of Surah Al Bayyina, which is Surah. One, which is Surah 98 of the Quran, right after the Surah on Laylatul Qadr. And in this Surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that what is the summary of true and pure religion? What is the summation of what this entire revelation has been calling you to? And then it takes us into not our origins, but into our future. That what happens to the, to the, to the evil ones and what happens to the khayrul bari'a, the best of people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets us choose which of those two paths we are going to take. So this surah that we're studying together today is a surah that is that that is essentially telling us that this which you found at the beginning and this which you found now later in Surah Al-Alaq and Surah Al-Bayyina is what this entire revelation is all about to teach you about your origins where you came from and to teach you about where you are going and to let you make the choice as to whether you want to go home from whence you came, or whether you want to go to a place of perdition in order to enjoy the short riches of this life. So with that, my brothers and sisters, inshallah, I'm going to share screen if I can. Um, the surah on the screen for you. I hope inshallah that all of you can see uh, the share screen that I've put up of the surah just in Arabic because I don't want you to become distracted with the different translations that appear and just to hear my words and my commentary inshallah. And so um, what I, I'm sharing with you is uh, the uh, surah that we are studying today in this bayan. 
very briefly, we want to take a deep dive into this beautiful river. This beautiful river that is known as the Surat al-Qadr. And it is, as I said, the 97th Surah of the Quran. And what is interesting about this is that it begins after Bismillah rahman rahim as all of the surahs of the Quran do, always bringing forth the truth of Allah Ta'ala's mercy and compassion as being the fountain of the entire ocean of the Quran. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in verse 1 says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qad. And the inna that we have right here, the inna, is a rhetorical tool that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses that can mean indeed or verily or by truth, right? To emphasize that what is about to come is of great and profound importance. And so if you're doing anything else, then take a break because you'll want to listen to what is being said here. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Anzalnahu, right? And there's two things about the Anzalnahu which are important to understand, is that it seems in the language itself that the entirety of something is being revealed. That the entirety of something is coming down and not just a portion of it, which will become significant as I move on with the commentary on the surah. And the who, it just says it. So it can be anything, right? From the standpoint of logic, it could be anything. That's the whole point of the word it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the rest of the Quran. And we see that throughout the Quran, whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to it, he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is referring to the book, the revelation, the Qur'an, al-Furqan, the criterion, this book, this mighty book that came to guide us, that came to give us light, that came to give us healing, all the way until the day of judgment and even after. So, so far, this verse is saying, verily, by truth, indeed, it was revealed. In, fi, laylatul qadr. And so how do we translate laylatul qadr? The layl part is easy. Layl means night. But the qadr part is a little bit more difficult because many of the commentators, they kind of fell on this division as to whether this night is about destiny or whether this night is about the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the majesty, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so there are many commentators who believe that this word qadr, right, which can actually mean different things depending on the context was a night in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would put forth every decree for all of creation into the entirety of the coming year. And so that this was the night of Allah ta'ala determining and commanding the destiny of every single creature all the way through the end of the year. And of course, this brings to uh, mind great hope because the hope is that wouldn't it be so fantastic if every single year my destiny could greatly change and I would have some control in that because if I do good and I pray earnestly unto God, then I can interfere in whatever the destiny is may have been written or unwritten. Uh, and perhaps, you know, I'm an active participant in the making of my destiny. So there's a lot of 
hope there when we think of Qadr in the way of destiny that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this night every year would command the decree. Uh, but the problem that lies with this is that if this is the night of decree, then what does it mean when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that, it, that when it comes to our Qadr, that this is something that the ink has been written and it has dried, right? Like that, that our Qadr is actually determined. So what is this idea that every single year Allah Ta'ala is coming and commanding the Qadr? Isn't, isn't Qadr something that has already been determined from before? So the response to that was that the Prophet Sallallahu himself, himself said that nothing comes in between you and Qadr, what Allah has ordained for you, other than your du'as. So the Prophet Sallallahu in a well-established hadith is indicating that there is something that can actually come between what Allah has ordained and the ultimate ordainment that is made after your du'a and people praying for you. And so perhaps what we can say is that the answer where, lies somewhere in between when it comes to this idea of it being the night of decree. That perhaps there is already that which has been decreed undoubtedly, but maybe there is yet more to be decreed. Or perhaps there are things that are decreed, but because of the power of this night and the du'as in it, that they interfere as the Prophet ﷺ was saying in that previous hadith that I mentioned, right? So these are all possibilities. But there's another set of commentators who's, who insisted that Qadr is actually more not about destiny, but about power and might and the awesomeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that it is manifested in the power that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to every single act of worship and obedience in this night. Such that as we are going to read in a moment what that power is going to be. But that Allah Ta'ala who is so powerful has the ability by his command to give power to seemingly small acts of worship and deeds in order to, to, in order to make it something quite incredible and quite mountainous and quite awesome, right? So that, that, that is what this night is much more about than about the decree. And Allah Ta'ala Alam, Allah knows best. So then in the second ayah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ And what adraka can you make can make you know ma what Laylatul Qadr is all about. So this is another beautiful, beautiful rhetorical device of the Quran in which that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks questions to the reader, to the thinker, to the contemplator of the Quran. And these questions are meant to make the thinker think. They're also meant to announce to you what and again do this rhetorical device that what I'm going to tell you, you better sit down and listen to it. Forgo all distractions. Listen to this because this is some serious stuff. And we see this form of rhetoric oftentimes, you know, if you're sitting in the class of a professor who knows rhetoric, you know, they'll say, and do you know what happened next? And it starts to make you wonder but it also makes you know that you don't actually know the answer and that the answer that's coming is going to blow your mind <laughs> so that's essentially what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing with the second ayah by tantalizing the reader and the thinker and the contemplator into saying do you know or what can make you even consider what can make, what can make you even know how can i even put into words what laylatul qadr this amazing night of power and destiny is all about. In the third ayah, 
Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says Laylatul Qadr khairum min alf shahr that this night so this is the first way of Allah Ta'ala answering that question that he just asked by saying that this night you know the night of power Laylatul Qadr the night of destiny and power is khair min than alf a thousand shahr Allah <laughs> so this is another beautiful rhetorical device that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the Quran that I'm going to I don't I can't give you an answer that you will be able to understand so I'm going to give you a metaphor I'm going to give you an analogy it's like that moment when the teacher knows so much but knows that there's no way for them to express and articulate it in a way that the person who is receiving it will even be able to understand so then what do we do we start to use metaphors we used to we start to use analogies and so this is why the commentators of the quran all of them they said that this notion that Laylatul Qadr is better than a thousand months. This idea of a thousand months is not something that is actually to be taken literally at all. <laughs> this is from the metaphors of the Quran, that these are from the signs of the Quran. And in reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by invoking a thousand months as a metaphor, is saying that, uh, that, that, uh, Essentially, uh, this is a night that is counted forever and ever in your deeds, in your accounts. Isn't that amazing? That forever and ever, the acts of worship and the deeds of goodness that you do on this night will be counted for your soul forever and ever, even when you're in your grave and on the day of resurrection and through your elevation in the stations of paradise. That these acts of worship and deeds will be with you this entire time. So a thousand months of merits and rewards for every act of worship is what is really meant by this verse. Those more of the modern period, the, the classics didn't really do this, but those in the modern period who want to take it literally, they have calculated that it is like the lifespan of 83 years, which when you think about it, even in any age, but especially in that time of revelation, but now even in our age, when we think about it, we think of 83 years as like a good lifespan. That that's a full life, full, full life. And we ask Allah to preserve all of our elders beyond their 83 years of life. Um, but we think of it as a good life, as a full life. And what this verse, if we read it literally, is saying is that uh, this night is better than, and every goodness and every act of worship and devotion that happens in this night is not only Alfa Shahr, but it is Khairum min Alfa Shahr. It is better. <laughs> than a full life of worship, a full life of doing good deeds. And so one might pause here for a moment and ask, you know, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on this one night making something so powerful? And the answer to that, my brothers and sisters, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to show us his power by making one night so powerful in terms of the way we as his ibad, as his servants and as his devotees and worshipers can experience it both in this life and in the hereafter. This is by the fadl, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us this one night that supersedes all other nights. And Before we go on uh, to the next ayah, 
one thing that uh, I didn't uh, share with you, uh, but I, I, I mentioned without fully sharing, is that, by the way, the idea in the first verse of Inna uh, Anzalnahu, uh, the it, uh, that most of the commentators actually believed that it, meaning the Qur'an, was revealed in its entirety from and descended from the highest of places in paradise, in the preserved tablet, the Lawh al-Mahfuz, and that all together and all at once it was then in this epic moment that makes this night so powerful, it actually then came into the house of might, which is known as Baytul Izza, the house of might and great honor. And this is found at the lowest heavens. This is found at the lowest of the heavens. And so it is, it became a house. The Quran, or rather uh, the house of might, Baytul Izza became a house for the, for the, for the uh, um, holding of the Quran. As then the second stage of revelation happened, which is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts to the angel Gabriel, to send the revelation upon the heart and upon the tongue of our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in piecemeal, in piecemeal over the course of his prophetic life, which spanned 23 years. Um, and so perhaps both things happened on this night. Perhaps, Allah ta'ala alam. But it's important to understand that Primarily, this is about the uh, descent of the Qur'an from Lawh al-Mahfuz to the Bayt al-Izzah, from the highest realms of the heavens to the most bottom levels of heavens, as a preparation for coming into the world, as a revelation, as the final contemplation, as the final, uh, as the final, uh, and most complete uh, word of God um, over uh, the course of these 23 years they found in the Quran comes upon the heart and tongue of the messengers of Allah. Um, so let us now go back uh, inshallah and the commentary for the rest of it is short but really really profound and interesting so we'll conclude soon. Um, so the next verse, which is four, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ تُنَزِّلُ yeah, Descend. مَلَائِكَةُ The angels, many, many, many angels. So the commentators, they say that the angels that descend on this night are, are in the thousands. That, are, that they are in the thousands, they're in the multitudes. There's a whole host of angels that are coming down on this night. You know, it's this, it's this light upon light because the angels are made of light, you know. And my brothers and sisters, we as Muslims, when we have faith in the unseen, what is always mentioned in the unseen are the angels. And it's very important for us to have a direct and a uh, intimate relationship with the angels through our knowing of them and also of our trying to experience them in our lives, you know. Knowing that there are, that there is an angel that sits on the right and on the left of every single human being. That this angel takes down, records your good deeds immediately and sends it to the heavens for final preservation. And then there's an angel on the left that sits and writes down your wrong deeds, but gives you time to wipe away the board through your istighfar, through your tawbah, through your asking of forgiveness and your returning to God and only sends it up after a certain point of time. We should know that there are angels in front of us and behind us that are accompanying us in order to protect us. We should know that the angels, one of their major functions from the heavens, according to 
uh, verses in the Quran is that they sing uh, God's praises and they ask Allah to bless and to forgive the creation on earth. You know, uh, and, 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 and there are two verses and one specifically mentions the believers while the other verse mentions everybody. So these angels are our friends. And there are angels that Allah Ta'ala has set to a particular task throughout the heavens and throughout the earth. But it seems that there are particularly made angels that Allah Ta'ala particularly made these light beams and beings specifically for this night. So what we understand from this is that uh, is that the angels come down as hosts, very special angels come down as hosts on this night to bless the night, to pray for peace upon every single worshiper, to ask Allah for blessings upon every single worshiper, to record the good deeds and so on and so forth. So they come down as hosts. And many of the commentators, they say that these angels are actually from the, uh, from, the, from the highest of places in paradise. That they come from the highest of places in the paradise that are close to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are very, very special angels that come down on this night. And then here, very, particular, very particularly, it says, وَالرُّوحُ so the angels along with the ruhu. And so the question becomes, what is the ruhu? And this is a question throughout the Quran, in fact, as to what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referring to when Allah ta'ala mentions what ruh. And for the most part, the commentators are very much in agreement, mostly, that this is in reference to the angel Gabriel himself. And that he is the angel of revelation. He is the teacher of the prophets, including Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That this is the great angel that Allah Ta'ala gave much distinction to. And that this angel comes down as well upon this night, which is incredible to think about. That angel Gabriel is in our midst in this night. Allah. And what is it that angel Gabriel comes with? He comes with Revelation, but revelation is ending. But perhaps what he is coming with is inspiration, is ilham into the hearts of the believers and the chosen ones from among the believers. Uh, but other commentators say uh, that this is actually a very noble angel from the highest of the heavens, and it's a special angel whose name that we don't know. And then a third explanation is that, in fact, what Ruhu has not anything to do with the angels whatsoever, but what Ruhu is actually about the spirit of Rahmah, the spirit of mercy, and the spirit of God's, what I just mentioned, inspiration. That God comes with Rahmah and with Ilham upon the hearts of every single devotee. So what ruhu could be about the rahmah and the ilham of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And God knows best. Fihi, fiha, you know, therein, meaning on this night, bi'idni rabbihim, by the permission of their Lord, ala min kulli amrin. And so what is this min kulli amrin? This min kulli amrin means, if you're looking at it from the qadr perspective, from the destiny perspective, that uh, the affair means the affair of every single thing, of every single creature for the rest of the year. Or min, min kulli amrin could mean that every single act of worship and devotion and dua and so on and so forth of goodness is being recorded. Every single affair is being recorded and blessed and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. So it is that is what is being spoken of when it comes to min kulli amr. And Allah knows best. 
And then the last verse, of course, my brothers and sisters, sorry for going long, is Salamun hiya hatta matla'in fajr. Peace. It is until the emergence of fajr, the dawn prayer. And so, very quickly, what is salam? Uh, many of the commentators, they say that this salam is the salam that the angels have bestowed upon the worshippers of the night. Because we know that one of the major functions of the heavenly uh, angels in particular is to say unto those who come into paradise, Salamun alaykum tibkun fiha khalidin. Right? That peace, you know, peace, 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 right? Salamun qawla min rabbi rahim. Peace, a word from your merciful Lord, is what the angels will be saying to the inhabitants of paradise. Um, it is also the peace that the whole universe for this short period of time between Isha and Fajr of this, of this particular night, that it should be a short period of time between Isha and Fajr where no evil happens, where there is total peace, total calm, total serenity, total perfection, both in the heavens and on earth. So if you wake up at night and you don't hear about anything that happened terribly wrong the night before, perhaps that's a sign, inshallah. And then it's peace in whatsoever Allah has ordained for the following year. When you look at it from the perspective of other, that whatever Allah has ordained for the believers, that this will be met with peace. And others simply say that it is the peaceful quietude of the night. That there's something very quiet, very, very, very quiet about this night um, that makes you feel at peace and that that is what it is a reference of between the time of Ersha and Fajr. So my brothers and sisters, uh, I hope that inshallah you enjoyed and found thought provoking some of this commentary. Thank you for your, for your patience. And in conclusion, uh, what should we be doing in order to meet this beautiful and awesome night? We should be doing to the best of our degree ittikaf, which is spiritual retreat in our homes, because of course we can't be at the masajids, but in our homes we should be in a state of spiritual retreat as much as possible. Take yourself to a room for hours, for hours, as long as you can, given your home situation, be in a state of spiritual retreat. Read Quran, read books of knowledge, pray, uh, make lots and lots of zikr. It's amazing how much zikr you can make when you really put, put your mind and your heart to it. And the most important thing is spending the nights in worship. You know, sometimes Muslims are very confused about what Laylatul Qadr is all about. They think it's for fundraising, or they think that it's for uh, a lot of lectures and talks. No, Laylatul Qadr is a night of power, is, is the night of worship. You want to be in sujood for as much of the night as you can. You want to be in qiyam and standing and bowing and prostrating as much as you can. Because these are the things that are going to count most for you on the day you meet your Lord. So that's what it should be all about. Everything else that may be needed from a communal standpoint should really be given a short, short, short amount of time. And it should really be about the, about the soul of, souls of the believers. That should be the concern more than anything else on this night. And the last thing that I leave you with is that uh, our lady Aisha, may God be pleased with her, the beloved wife of the Prophet وسلم, asked, O Messenger of God, when we seek this night, what dua, what supplication should we be making to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so the supplication I want to leave you with is, Allahumma inna ta'afoon tuhibbul af fa'fu anna. O Allah, you are the effacer of sins. You love to efface sins. So, our Lord, efface our sins. Right? And we talked about this last week, but very briefly, Afu, Al-Afu is different than Al-Ghafur. Al-Ghafur is someone who forgives, but Al-Afu is someone who totally wipes it out as if it never even happened. Water poured over it doesn't exist. It didn't even happen. 
So this is what we invoke on this night, is that this is the night of salvation from the hellfire, admittance into the gardens of paradise. So we should be asking for al-afu, the one who wipes away completely our traces of sins even, out of his generosity and kindness. So with that, my brothers and sisters, I ask your pardon for having gone so long. Also, also I'm on a lot of drugs and uh, sometimes I end up uh, speaking more than I intended. So please forgive me and please stay, please stay uh, to receive the dua and the blessing from our beloved uh, sister Yusra, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Imam Sayyid. Yes, sir, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you're good to go. Wa alaikum salam. Great, I'll start. Oh Allah, you are our Lord, our protector, our guide. You are the beneficent, the merciful, the wise, the controller of all things. We begin in praise of you, for you alone are our Lord. And we send peace and blessings upon your beloved Prophet Muhammad and his family. We ask Allah for your mercy in this month of mercy, the month of your revelation, the month of fasting. Have mercy upon our souls and accept our deeds from this month and beyond. Accept our fasts, accept our prayers, our deeds, known and unknown to others. Accept our supplications. Forgive us Allah for our weaknesses. For nothing we ever do for you will ever come close to the true magnificence of what you are. So we ask for your forgiveness always. We ask Allah in these final 10 days that you allow us and facilitate for us to gain the most out of it. Let us make the most. Let Help us motivate ourselves to engage in deeper prayer, deeper supplication, and deeper reflection. Let us find the night of power and let us benefit immensely from it. Let us come out of this month, Allah, as better believers, better beings, and lead us into Jannat al-Firdaus. We do not know, Allah, when our return to you is, but we ask that if it is your will, allow us to witness the Ramadans to come so that we can continue to reap the benefits of your mercy and blessings. Allah, we ask that you especially grant your favor to our beloved students whose academic year have come to a close we ask for all those that are graduating, Allah, that you place them under your protection. Keep them on your path. Keep them in consciousness of you. Grant them success of the highest forms, the highest levels, and let them continue to grow in their faith and goodness. We ask for your mercy, Allah, over all those who are undergoing trials, suffering in different ways. Grant us relief. Grant us a way out of our difficulties and let us master ourselves in a way to handle trials in the best manner possible. For those innocent civilians who suffered throughout the world, Allah, we ask for them your mercy. For the men, women, children, newborn babies who have been unjustly killed on our streets, in our neighborhoods, schools, homes, and hospitals, Allah, grant them your mercy. Grant them immediate entrance into the gardens and ease the trials of their loved ones. Grant them strength to bear with these difficulties. And we ask Allah that you deal with the oppressors justly and have them answer for their horrible actions. We ask Allah that you grant healing to all our sick and for all of those who have passed, grant you their souls an easy reckoning and Jannat al those and grant their loved ones strength. We ask that you protect our caregivers and all our loved ones from illness and harm. And Allah, we are grateful to have those in our midst who are deeply reflective and in submission to you. And as our beloved Imam Suhaib writes about your mercy and your miracles, we ask you to grant him your miracles, whatever you determine them best to be. We ask that you heal him, and we also know that you are the wise, the determiner, and therefore we accept these trials and whatever the outcome is. But we ask that this trial always be a means of elevation for him, a way to gain even more closeness with you and to elevate the ranks of Imam Suhaib, Arshi, Radia, their parents, their siblings, their nieces and nephews. Envelop them in your love and mercy throughout their living in this realm and the next. You alone we worship Allah and you alone we call for help. We beseech you and we praise you and we send our blessings always 
to our, send our peace and blessings always to our beloved Prophet Muhammad and his family. Amen. Amen.